Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Henrik Ibsen's play Ghosts. So this is one of those plays that like really reveals what modern drama was all about. The, the modern drama particularly that Ibsen helped invent. Because this, in uh, the late 1800s, when the play was first performed, would have been quite a shocking play, let me tell you. So, the premise of the play, uh, we have Mrs. Alving, who is a widow, wealthy widow, uh, in this sort of northern, um, sort of small town kind of, kind of, uh, area of uh, Norway. She is building an orphanage in honor of her late husband to commemorate his memory. And she's visited by Manders, who's their sort of family priest who used to be real good friends with them, but they've sort of drifted away. Manders represents this very sort of bourgeois 19th century part of it part of his character is about like repression but it's less repression for its own sake so even though he's a priest his arguments that he makes about these sort of ethical issues moral issues are not rooted in what's ethically correct or what's spiritually correct. His arguments are rooted in what looks good to the community. So we first get this. Um, Manders is shocked, shocked by some of the literature that Mrs. Alving has. We don't find out exactly what it is, um, but we can assume, I guess, that it's um, I don't think it. Yeah, it just says books, magazines, and newspapers in the the stage directions. So we can assume this would be whatever sort of modern literature, whatever whatever scandalous at the time. Um, and and Manders is taken aback at this, and while he admits that literature may have some sort of value. He does warn her, but one doesn't talk about it, Mrs. Alving. So this is Manders' shtick, largely. Um, somewhat like Torvald uh, Helmer in, um, in A Doll's House, Manders is essentially this sort of voice of bourgeois society where keeping up appearances is the primary consideration so we find out um so alving oswald alving uh comes in He's a he's a bohemian painter who's been living in Paris, so that's worth noting. Um, and he talks, he and he and Manders and Mrs. Alving talk about the way that the bohemians live in Paris. And Manders is basically like, oh, they're degenerates and they're just all being terrible and unethical and whatnot and living in sin and all these things. And Oswald is like, you know, I've actually seen um, people living perfectly happy, healthy, moral lives with women that they're not married to. And the primary concern here is men, because, you know, 19th century. Um, so Oswald sort of sticks up for this idea that you can live with a woman, a man can live with a woman that he's not married to, have children with her, and still be ethically good but he also points out that he has seen these men um who are very sort of respected middle class married men 
who've come to the artist circles and just behaved in these incredibly like debauched ways. So Manders is shocked by this. And again, Mander, it's hard to tell, I think, from a per the perspective of 2022, how much Manders is pearl clutching is a sort of accurate representation of the actual bourgeois theater going audiences that Ibsen would have been staging these plays for. I mean, it seems like Manders is something of a caricature, but his perspective is not necessarily all that foreign to the audiences who were in fact shocked by the the content that Ibsen put on his stage. And this is one of those elements where you have a character defending cohabitation and even having children out of wedlock. Like that, that prior to Ibsen, that almost never would have happened in the 19th century, the 18th century on the stage. These things simply would not have have been spoken of in any sort of positive way. And then we move on and we start to learn more about Mrs. Alving. And we learn that early in her marriage, she was dreadfully unhappy with her husband. She fled her husband's home to Manders because she was into Manders. Um, her husband, and basically Manders, this is all happening in Act 1. So we're getting a lot of stuff going on in Act 1 here. Um, Manders basically tries to explain to her the official position about why she had needed to return to her husband. So he says here, To crave for happiness in this world is simply to be possessed by spirit of revolt. What right have we to happiness? No, we must do our duty, Mrs. Alving, and your duty was to cleave to the man you had chosen and to whom you were bound by a sacred bond. Mrs. Alving says, You know quite well what sort of a life my husband was living at that time, what excesses he was guilty of. And Manders says, I know only too well what rumor used to say of him, and I should be the last person to approve of his conduct as a young man, supposing that rumor spoke the truth. But it is not, the, not a wife's part to be her husband's judge. You should have considered it your bounden duty humbly to have borne the cross that a higher will had laid upon you. But instead of that, you rebelliously cast off your cross. You deserted the man whose stumbling footsteps you should have supported. You did what was bound to imperil your good name and reputation and came very near to imperiling the reputation of others into the bargain. So basically, this goes on for a while. Um, Manders is giving these sort of self-righteous speeches and, oh, I saved you by forcing you to go back to your husband who was living this debauched, uh, terrible existence, etc., etc. Then we get this moment where Mrs. Alving says, the truth is this, that my husband died just as great a profligate as he had been all his life. And Manders, according to the stage direction, feeling for a chair, says, What are you saying? Mrs. Alving says, After nineteen years of married life, just as profligate in his desires at all events as he was before you married us. So basically, Manders sent her back to her husband, who never made any attempt to reform his behavior or to become a better husband or better human being. And as a result of his activities, um, he developed a an unspecified venereal disease. It's not entirely clear that that contributed to his death eventually, but it's also not ruled out here. Manders is not thrilled with this uh, thing. But again, this is another instance in which um, in which Ibsen is doing something quite shocking for the time because at the time you would not on stage have spoken about venereal disease even without directly mentioning it 
So this accusation Mrs. Elving makes that her husband was sexually diseased simply would have been unprecedented in at least the living memory of, of the theater at this time. We also learn that Mr. Alving, the late Mr. Alving, um, had essentially raped the maid at the time, and the maid got pregnant, and she was sent away from the house. And Act 1 ends with uh, the sounds from the dining room of Oswald doing something to the maid, Regina. We don't know exactly what it is. The implication is that he is attempting to kiss her, if not outright rape her. Um, but considering that his mom and priest are in the next room, that seems somewhat unlikely to me. But Mrs. Alving does say, uh, when, when, asked, when Manders asks what's wrong, she does say ghosts, the couple in the conservatory, over again. So we get that, that echoing here. Oswald echoes his father in this behavior. Now, this becomes particularly significant because in Act 2, we learn that Regina is the daughter of the woman that Oswald's father had raped. So essentially, Regina, who's been the servant in the Alving's home, is Oswald's half-sister, Mr. Alving's illegitimate daughter. It gets a bit weird in Act 2 because Mrs. Alving seems to contemplate maybe having Oswald and Regina get married, even though they're half-siblings. Um, Manders is 100% not on board with this. Um, but again, much of it, much of Manders' perspective is based on this question of like, what will people say? And Mrs. Alving, interestingly, she, she actually doesn't support um, Oswald and, and Regina getting married, but she does say... Uh, in response to Manders' critique of, of this potentially incestuous sibling union, that, well, for, that ma for the matter of that, we are all descended from a union of that description, so we are told. And who was it that was responsible for this state of things, Mr. Manders? So, I mean, scorch for God in the Bible, I guess, if you take... If you take Genesis to be literally true, which of course it isn't, but you know. Um, so we've got, again, these like scandalous things being said, questioning the legitimacy of the Bible on stage, etc., etc. We go on uh, in Act 2. Um, Oswald reveals that he has a venereal disease which, because his mother has always sort of built up this idealistic lie about who his father was, uh, he, the, the doctor tells him that it is a hereditary disease, that, or that he has inherited it from his father. Oswald refuses to accept this because he believes this saintly picture that his mother has painted, um, but he has, in fact, inherited it from his father. And he is... Uh, he is dying of this disease. And at the end of the play, actually, there's one more interesting storyline I want to come back to with Manders. But at the end of the play, where we actually end up is Oswald partially had wanted to marry Regina, or at least cohabitate with her, because he believed that when his sort of final attack came, and he uh, lost his mental facilities completely, 
Um, but he, he, he's going to enter this sort of vegetative state, basically. And he has a packet of morphine powder, enough to kill him, and he believed that Regina would be willing to do that for him. Be when the secret of Regina's paternity comes out, she actually leaves, um, somewhat unshockingly. She's not any longer that interested in marrying Oswald. Um, and when she learns that he's sick, she loses interest in marrying him as well. So, you know, sort of double trouble there. Mrs. Alving ends up being very, very reluctant to potentially poison her son. Essentially, this is assisted suicide. Again, quite a shocking thing to put on the stage in the late 1800s. But in the last moments of the play, Oswald just completely disintegrates. And we know, even though it's not shown on stage, that Mrs. Alving is going to kill her son. Now, the other thing, there's a lot of layers of irony in this play, and a lot of them actually revolve around Manders. But I like this one in particular. And again, this is that sort of 19th century Torvald Helmer style, what will the neighbors think? thing. Because Mrs. Alving um, wants to insure the buildings for the orphanage, the ones that are currently being built. And Manders is basically like, uh, let's not do that because people will think it looks bad. So basically his argument is, in town there are lots of, of them, all my fellow clergymen's congregants, for instance. It would be so extremely easy for them to interpret it as meaning that neither you nor I had a proper reliance on divine protection. So basically, the the argument that he makes is people will question it if we insure these buildings for this orphanage we're building because it will make it look like we don't really believe that the orphanage is going to be protected by God against any unforeseen eventualities. Now, we see, especially, the irony of this almost immediately, because at the very end of that conversation, uh, Mrs. Alving is like, oh, um, there was almost a fire up there the other day. Which is foreshadowing. Not super cunning foreshadowing. It's not the most subtle foreshadowing in the, the history of the world. Because at the end of Act 2, basically that act closes with uh, the fire, uh, uh, the orphanage on fire. It's, it's burning down. And Manders, we get the last couple of lines of, of Act 2, Manders says, How terrible, Mrs. Alving. That fire is a judgment on this house of sin. Mrs. Alving says, Quite so. Come, Regina. Then she and Regina hurry out. Manders, clasping his hand, says, and no insurance. Apparently, having forgotten that Mrs. Alving was like, we should insure this building because there was almost a fire the other day, and Manders was like, psh, fire insurance. God will take care of it. 